For more than 25 years, the La Mesa Model Railroad Club, located in the San Diego Model Railroad Museum in Balboa Park, has been building an HO scale replica of the railroad between Bakersfield and Mojave through the Tehachapi Mountains. To date, almost 28 scale miles have been built. The railroad climbs from 33 inches above the floor to 170 inches above the floor, which represents 990 scale feet. 60 car trains are regularly run over this mountain, complete with helper engines interspersed throughout the train. On special operating sessions, even longer trains have been operated. Mountain railroading is difficult for the real railroad and it's no simpler in the model. It requires careful consideration and detailed construction of the rolling stock in order to make this possible. This video is an interview with Car Department Foreman John Cathcart, who shares his information on how to build rolling stock for mountain operations. So I'm John Cathcart. I'm the Car Department Foreman, Mesa Model Road Club. I've been the Car Department Foreman for 40 years. Uh, and when we were in La Mesa, I was a Car Department Foreman. Um, how many cars do you think you've registered in your life? <clears throat> Close to 10,000. Wow. We start with the gauging wheels. We're using an NMR gauge, which is designed for the RP25 wheel contour, but since the manufacturers have taken upon themselves to improve that wheel by narrowing the flange, how do you gauge a non-RP25 wheel with an RP25 gauge? And our true RP25 wheel is gonna drop right into these two notches and fill all of that space up and have no movement whatsoever, and that's either a go or no go gauge for an RP25 wheel, but unfortunately, Nobody makes an RP25 wheel anymore. It's all what we call here a sub-RP25 wheel. If you have a wheel set, it's over all the way over to one side here against this edge. The corresponding wheel should be against the corresponding edge on the other side. So this is what I do. I start down here and come this way. If it, when it hits that corner there, that, that right there, that's a caution, right? If, uh -huh. if it hits that corner, it really should be rejected. If you're it's doing a little narrow then, because it's hitting narrow. the corner. Because yeah, you've got corner. the lower flange against the lower edge of the lower notch. Right, right. And the upper flange is hitting the lower edge of the top notch. Right. What I do, take the wheel out, twist it just as though it has threads. It has none, but you get the most physical force that way. Push it in or out as you twist it to get the desired effect, widen or narrow it. Once you've determined that you're you're happy with the gauge of the wheel, put it back in the in the trucks, spin the wheels in the trucks, and count how long, how many seconds those things will spin. The minimum time you want any wheel to spin in any axle is going to be at least 20 seconds. That corresponds to about a somewhere between a one and a half and a two percent grade. Now, if it doesn't spin, <clears throat> there's a couple of cures. I prefer to just bend the side frames of the truck because we're only talking thing on the order of ten thousandths of an inch here. Now, you'll have to bend it more than that. Yeah. I will. I would take this and and tweak this quite a bit. So you want to do it over both side frames because you don't. You're trying not to parallelogram them, but the, like I said, the wheelbase is so short it probably doesn't matter if they do. But um, you have to remember since it's plastic, and especially in the case of like the Kato, it's Delrin. Plastic has a memory. Anything you bend in there, it's going to lose probably 40 to 50 percent of that overnight. So you want to be overbending it. So if I, if I'm looking for 10 or 12 thousandths overall, I'm going to tweak that Delrin side frame pretty good because it's going to go back. It's got that memory, and so I'll check it tomorrow when I come in and, and do the roll test again. So now what's next is we're going to put the trucks back on the car. And before we adjust the trucks properly for rotation and um, free play, we're going to do the surface plate test. This is to make sure that the car is sitting square on the trucks and that all eight wheels are going to make contact with the rail. It's very important that you be able to tighten your trucks up enough with the truck screw that the trucks do not rotate or at least not rotate freely. That's so that they're tight. Pull it. So that way you're pulling it up against you're the pulling surface, it up against the, the bolster surface, surface. The two mating surfaces, the truck bolster against the body bolster. And then you put okay. it, you should have a piece of glass, a piece of formica like this is good if you know it's true. You want to have a light behind it and a bright surface. So when you get down and look between the wheel and where the wheel is supposed to meet the, the surface, the surface plate, tabletop, whatever you have, glass plate, if you don't have anything else, you should not be able to see any daylight between any of the wheels and the surface. Now that the car is flat, 
we right. want to have the proper rotation of the truck. Right. What you want is you want your truck to be loose enough to rotate um, without binding. So you want the lightest, longest possible thing you can find. Barbecue skewer is great because it weighs practically nothing. It's a long lever so it magnifies any resistance and while this looks to rotate freely I can feel a lot of resistance in that wheel. And what you're feeling for is that there's a little bit of resistance or none at all? You, you want as little as you can get. You want none if you can get it. The trick is you want zero resistance while having almost no rocking from side to side like we have here. Now you have to have some motion. The next thing we're going to do is check the couplers. And before I do that, I'll have to tell you about the coupler gauges. When you have a gauge, a gauge is a standard against which you're going to check everything you do. So you're not comparing the bottom of the coupler or the top of the coupler. The only place that you can compare where it's going to come out the same is going to be on the center line of the shank. And fortunately for us, there's a parting mark or casting mark on every knuckle it shows you where that is. There's the, the yeah. horizontal line there. You can highlight that a little bit with a file. So I just file the black off of that, as I've done here. Uh, there's a little line across here. Because when you compare couplers, you're going to have different head heights. And you want the cent those center lines to line up rather than the top or bottom edge of the coupler. First, a good test for any coupler is make sure the coupler is where it wants to be because the spring inside can affect it. Those little fingers that press on the side of it can actually make it make the coupler go up or down depending on how they're aligned and how they mate with the surface, the banjo section of that coupler. So you want to make sure the coupler is going to be where it wants to be. So, and it's pretty straightforward. Um, put the car on the gauge, make sure the gauge is not rocking, uh, is on the railhead properly, and you can put the two together. Here we see this coupler is, is okay. quite considerably low on this end. The cure for that, for a lot of people, is just to simply take the trucks off, put a, a shim in there, uh -huh. which KD makes, and raise the whole car up by that much. Right. The trouble is, that is a lot of elevation change. Mm -hmm. And you, what you really have to do is be familiar with your equipment and the prototype you're modeling and, and have available to you photos where you can look at this and say, is that going to make the car sit too high? And how about the drooping coupler problem? The drooping coupler problem is pretty easy to fix because you, you can actually fix it. Um, if you do it right, you can fix it without taking the coupler apart if it's just a droopy coupler. And sometimes you have excess free play in the coupler relative to the draft gear box in both directions. So not only is it droopy, but you can push it up so it's too high. So what you want to do is insert a shim in there without disassembling the coupler. I use um, HO scale one by two lumber size, which you can get from Evergreens. And the proper way to do this is you do a test fit. Don't cut the piece, just take the whole stock and stick it in the draft gear under the coupler. Test fit it dry like that. What's probably happened in most cases is the, if it's not a new car, is that the coupler box lid is worn, bent, whatever, uh, from use. And it, they just acquire more free play over time. So whatever your shim is, you, you'll test fit it and see, will the coupler still move? I tell people to cut your shim so that the length is three quarters the width of the box because you don't want it to go from corner to corner because if you do the couplers always jam in the corners because the clearance is tighter. Stick it in there with a pair of tweezers, locate it, um, hold the coupler down with my finger against the shim once I've got the shim in there, take a drop of MEK or super glue on a pin, something very small, and just touch it to that shim, let the capillary action draw the, the liquid cement in there. And, and hold it there till it's it's on its way to setting. And, uh, so you can see where the shim is. Yeah, right. So now we have, um, how much free play do we have here? Very little, almost zero, which is about ideal. And, and, and a coupler still goes. So now let's check our gauge again with that coupler. <coughs> see if that did what we wanted. The 60 minute interview goes into greater depth in gauging wheels rollability, fitting trucks, couplers, but also covers weight and the center of gravity.